My name is Kelly Garney, and today I'm here to talk about how um, I got into music and how uh, it's affected me my whole entire life. In fact, I'm still in music, much as I try not to be. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, my thing with music started when I was 11 years old. Uh, I've suddenly been tossed into uh, junior high school, mixed in with uh, greater numbers of students uh, than I had ever been. Uh, and as predicted, uh, students that didn't really get who I was or understand me, um, I was sort of ostracized. And um, I wasn't alone. There was another kid just like me who didn't fit in, wasn't popular. And his name was Randy Rhodes. And um, we sort of gravitated towards each other and became very good friends. And um, eventually ended up with him teaching me bass. When I met him, he was playing guitar already, although he didn't know how to play lead yet. And um, he was just learning them. And so with my uh, appearance into his life, he decided to make a bass player out of me, which was very convenient for a guitar player learning his leads. Because he had me to play little patterns and then he would practice his leads over me. So everything that he learned, he would use me as sort of a sounding board to try his new knowledge over actual music. And that was how we learned. As, as he learned, I learned. And that went on for several years. Um, we spent most of our uh, real young youth there um, with dreams of be growing up and becoming rock stars and we did everything we could to uh, further that. His brother uh, had a band, in fact his whole entire family was musical. His mother owns a music school. Uh, his brother was a drummer at the time and eventually became a singer. Uh, his sister played guitar. Uh, so there was, uh, the dog didn't play anything so um, uh, that that one we don't have to go into, but um, uh, we ended up uh, following his brother around a little bit to see kind of like how this band thing works, and that was how we learned how to actually put together a band, write songs, and eventually play somewhere live, which in our case started with us uh, doing something that a lot of uh, bands in Burbank where we grew up were doing, and that was playing at a lot of um, surfer parties, high school parties, uh, backyard uh, keggers, whatever, what do you, whatever you want to call them. A bunch of kids at a house that uh, shouldn't be there and a big party going on and they got a rock band. And, um, and that was how we grew up, was playing in these, um, these backyard parties, living rooms, wherever they let us set up. Of course, the parties always got busted by the cops and uh, they would be shut down, but even if we got to play for 15 minutes, uh, we were happy with that. Uh, as long as we got something in there, and, and that was enough to always be sort of a fuel for our desire to um, pursue our dreams, which was to be actual rock stars. And we were very, very, very heavily into Alice Cooper, and we used that as, um, as a blueprint to what we wanted our band to be like. Sort of by chance, we happened to meet a gentleman by the name of Kevin Dubrow, who claimed he was a singer. And we went to meet with him, and when we saw him, we said, well, he's, he's not what he, we're looking for. He doesn't, he has black hair, but he, he's certainly not some guy that's like Alice Cooper. Uh, and that was really our problem. We really couldn't find anyone who was. Um, but Kevin clearly was not Alice Cooper. so. Um, right off the bat, we, we pretty much weren't interested in playing with them, but we sat and listened to him anyways and, um, and talked with him. And he was a nice guy. He played us some uh, videos that didn't have sound uh, of him singing. And we, although we couldn't hear him, we saw him jumping about and acting like he was in a band. So, I mean, that, that was okay, but it still wasn't what we wanted. But we acquired a drummer, Drew Forsyth, who was uh, originally in some bands with me and Randy prior to meeting Kevin. And long story short, uh, eventually Quiet Riot was, was formed. And uh, we were, through Kevin, who was more of a businessman than we were, 
we were able to, to quickly get a, a manager who invested money in the band. We had a place to rehearse. We had people, uh, we had actual roadies. Instead of having to carry our own amps now, we had people that did it. And it actually looked like we were making some sort of progress, and, and we stuck with it. It, it wasn't what we had dreamed of, but it, it wasn't bad. It, it, it would work for that time for me and Randy. And uh, as time went on, our first manager became not really the best thing for us and eventually got arrested and thrown in prison uh, for drug dealing, which was how he was financing us, we found out. Uh, at any rate, he was a nice guy, so that, however he makes his money. Quiet Riot was a band that struggled and struggled for many years on the Sunset Strip. Although we, we didn't play there exclusively, we were pretty much considered the house band at an infamous club called the Starwood in Hollywood on La Cienega and, um, and uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, since been torn down. Uh, but we seemed like we were there for, for a couple of years, um, at least three years that I can recall. And we were always just playing there. Every once in a while, we'd have an, another gig somewhere else. But, but for the most part, we were at the Starwood. And a lot of problems began to develop in the band to where it was stagnating. Uh, personality conflicts, particularly between me and Kevin Dubrow, started to arise. Uh, I developed a, a horrendously bad drinking problem. And all these things added up in, into what eventually was disaster for the band. And um, after one incident in particular that involved me firing a gun in Randy's presence, some people like to say that I fired at him or near him, but I did not. We had a disagreement. I ordered him out of my house. He refused to leave. Uh, I had a gun in the cushion of my chair because I lived in a dangerous neighborhood. I pulled out the gun. I pointed it straight up fired one bullet and um, he charged at me and we had both been drinking very heavily. So that's probably just the wisest thing to learn from that little incident was guns and alcohol don't mix. So we had a little fight after that. I ended up getting thrown in jail and when I got out the next day, everything was fine between me and Randy. Um, we had had fights in the past. Uh, we grew up much like brothers, and we were best friends and spent every moment we could with each other, doing everything, chasing a dream. Uh, we shared all the, the rites of passage that any two kids growing up would, would experience, and these were the things that made our friendship so strong. And that's why after what many consider to be uh, a horrendously, potentially lethal, dangerous, almost Randy was killed kind of an incident, whatever they say about me. Um, it was really not that at all. Um, you were basically brothers. We were brothers just having a, a, a knockdown, drag out, roll on the floor and, and mess up some furniture fight, which we had done no less than a dozen times before. Except you needed a new roof after that. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, yeah, I did have to repair the hole in the roof. Where, where do you start in the book? Where, where's the beginning? Where, what, what do you cover in the very beginning? That's a very good question. Where do I start in this book? You know, that, that was what I really had to wonder when I started writing it, is where do I start? I, I had never written a book, although I'd gone to college for screenwriting and written a, a number of screenplays. Um, and then some other little writing, and I've always had an interest in writing, I'd never had written a book. And I had the opportunity to do so. And so I sat down to, to write this book about Randy Rhodes. That's what they told me. Write a book about Randy Rhodes. They, you, they, they said, you knew him better than anybody. And if anybody can tell the world what he was like as a person, it's you. And I thought, well, okay, but how in the world do I really do this? And um, I found that in the end, after looking at all the books that were already out there about Randy, that they all pretty much were kind of the same in that they were more of a, a history book uh, that um, 
Many of the books utilized magazine articles and, and previous interviews with people and things like that, and I didn't want to do it that way, because then my book would be like everybody else's. So what I did was I finally made the decision, well, I'll write my life story. Uh, I, people have told me, wow, you, you've had a really interesting life and you should write about your life. And I, I'm, you know, I'm sure everybody in the world gets told that by somebody at some point in their life because nobody in this world is boring, truly. And, and so I thought, you know, well, maybe in this case, you know, maybe somehow my life story can tell Randy's story. And so I decided to approach it like that. That kind of put a lot of difficulty on me because, first of all, <laughs> I haven't been exactly a, a model human being in my lifetime, and I've had my issues. And um, bringing all this, you know, to life in in the form of pages and basically burying my soul for everybody, it's not as easy as you think it is. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it, 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 sometimes it gives you major anxiety fits, particularly after the book is out. Then you start, at night you're going, wow, you know, everybody now knows that about me. You know, how do I feel about that? And, and it, it freaks you the fuck out, is what it does. It, I mean, it's, it really, you know, you start thinking, you know, oh my God, you know, and, and, and this person I wrote about, you know, what's going to happen if I ever run into them, you know, and are they going to punch me in the face because I wrote something they didn't like, and, you know, and I had all these problems, and I'm like, well, I already don't know what I'm doing here, and now I've got all these problems, and I'm like, Jesus. And so I said, well, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll just start from the middle. Rather than start from the beginning, I'll start from the middle. So, the aforementioned incident with Randy and a firearm <laughs> was where I started. <laughs> Only, uh, I kind of start after the fact. I, I wake up in a jail cell, and that's where I start my book, is me waking up. My eyes are caked shut from, from blood. Uh, I blacked out uh, from alcohol, and... Um, I, I went on to explain that the, the reason, I, there, there's a, a very good reason why I was so drunk. Randy as well, and a good friend of ours, Kim, was there as well. But I had, the night before I'd been at a club in, in Hollywood called the Cabaret, I was there to see some bands, and, and the club caught on fire. Everybody ran out. I was sitting with these two girls, these groupy kind of girls, and everybody ran out of the whole club, and, and we just sat there just, like nothing happened. The band left the stage. I was drinking a beer and having a cigarette. And I, I didn't feel like joining the mad rush of people that were rushing out of the place because there was all this smoke billowing down from the, where the dressing rooms were. And I wasn't afraid. And so pretty soon, it was just me and these two girls sitting in this club on fire. And so I finished my beer and I said, well, uh, let's go. Let's leave girls, and as I got to the front door, there was a bar right there to the right, and there was nobody behind it because the bartender had fled for his life. So there was nobody around. So I said, huh, well, opportunity only knocks once. So I jumped over the bar, and I just started grabbing bottles of booze and handing them to the girls and telling them, here, stuff this down your bra, put this in your purse, put this down your pants. I had a bunch. Both girls had a bunch. I ended up with close to 20 bottles of liquor, fifths of rum, whiskey, vodka, you name it. I, had a, I basically had my own personal bar. And, um, and this is all stuff I couldn't have normally afforded anyway. So um, I really didn't see it as taking advantage of, of a club in a rather dire situation with being on fire, you know, and here's this, this shitty kid who they actually pay to play there once in a while. He's ripping off the bar. I, I didn't have any kind of uh, uh, logic uh, that existed in me. I just saw an opportunity to get some free booze, and, and, and sadly that's kind of a, one of the downfalls of being an alcoholic is, is you create uh, opportunities for yourself to drink and, uh, and, and it's okay to do certain things, like totally rip off a bar that's on fire, 
forget dis disregarding your own personal safety and two girls, you know, fuck that. Let's just get the booze. You know, this is an alcoholic for you. So I, I realized very early on in starting my book that I was going to have to cop to all that. And, and it's things like that that caused me a lot of uh, anxiety and apprehension. But I said, no. I said, you know, if I got the balls to talk to people the way I do, to do interviews and, and go up on stage and have people point at me and say he's the guy that that uh, played with Randy Rhodes and he grew up with Randy and he was his best friend and all these things that people say to me and go down to his grave once a year as I have for 30 years now um, and, and talk to fans and, and sign their things and be the guy that signs their autograph and, and if I'm going to be that guy I have to be totally honest with myself and the first thing I have to get straight with myself is there ain't going to be no hiding shit in this book. It's all coming out. So get used to that right now. And I did. So the book starts off with me waking up in jail. My eyes are caked shut from blood because I had a cut from here to here from Randy's famous long thumbnail that he had. This was all a case of a thing called quiet riot in the very final stages of death. Quiet Riot, the band as, as we knew it, the band that I was in, the band that I formed with Randy, it was coming to an end, that version. I'm happy to say it still exists, thanks to Frankie Benelli, and uh, I, I have so much gratitude to Frankie for not only being such a great friend for all these years, but for keeping the Quiet Riot name alive and for having the successes that he has. I mean, I watched the Super Bowl yesterday and, <laughs> you know, here's Quiet Riot in a commercial and right before that, you know, before they cut the commercial, you had Crazy Train with Randy Rhodes. So I had Randy Rhodes and Kevin Dubrow at the Super Bowl. And that pretty much happens every football game. But, you know, that's all, that's all Frankie right there. Frankie's kept that band alive. It's, it's died several times and it's been resurrected. And there are different versions of it, but the name is still there. So, uh, that being the case, I also had to be respectful of, of the current version of Quiet Riot as well. And, and there were a lot of little sensitive issues, of politics with Randy's family, um, other people that, that were somewhat involved in Randy's life. And I just said, fuck it. If I'm going to say something shitty about me, and I got something shitty to say about somebody else, right here is my confession. I've, Nikki, I'd have to almost say, was, was probably of all the people that I looked to in writing this book, Nikki Six, of all people, was the person who helped me more than anybody. I've never met Nikki. As far as I know, when I looked down from the stage at the Starwood during one of my shows, he was one of those guys down there in the audience that, that had a look going on and was hanging with some hot chicks, you know, and looked like he was in a band or something. And, and he was one of those guys. And I was pretty sure, you know, I, I knew I was looking at, at the future of music down there. And I knew I was looking at my competition. And I knew I was looking at other bands down there watching my band and critiquing us or being jealous or whatever the case may be. But, but I'm pretty sure I saw Nikki Six down there more than once. But um, I've never met him face to pay, face. But I... Um, um, when, when you're on that role and you're, you're traveling with a band that's bigger than life, I mean, are you thinking how long is this going to last? Oh, yeah. You think it's going to end tomorrow. You, you, think it, you think it's all... It's, well, you actually... You're kind of split. You you think it's it's either something's got to happen that's going to make it all end, or if you're more optimistic, which you have to be to be in a band, you have to be an optimist. You can't be a pessimist. You're you'll never make it. You have to believe you are going to make it. So nine times out of ten, you're more under the the assumption that well, any day now I'm going to be a big star. Any day now, I'm going to be on MTV or whatever the deal was back then. Uh, any day, I'm going to be on the cover of Rolling Stone, for, to paraphrase uh, a great rock and roll cliche. Um, but um, 
but Nikki, I read Nikki's books and I, and I saw, I was like, wow, you know, this dude is really confessing everything, you know, and I said, well, I have to do that then. And I had no problem with it. And I respected Nikki for doing it. Some shit he said about himself didn't make himself look very good. And I said, I'm going to have to do that too. In fact, when the Rhodes family read my book, they said, you don't make yourself look very good in this book. And I said, that's because it's true. I wasn't very good. I, I was a fuck up. I screwed shit up. You know, I was a drunk. Um, people like to say I was a drug addict. That part isn't true either. I was very, very not into drugs. Like everybody else in that era, certainly in that place, the Hollywood Sunset Strip, you know, it was basically snowing cocaine. You couldn't go anywhere without, you know, getting a bunch of cocaine up your nose. And, um, you know, you'd walk into any bathroom in any club and everybody would be lined up at the mirror, you know, either doing their hair or sticking something up their nose. And that's just how it was, you know. And, yeah, okay, so we did some coke. But we really weren't into the drug thing. We, we were more into the drinking, which is not, might in comparison sound horrible that, that drinking is worse than cocaine, but it really... It falls on the individual. In my, in my particular case, I was not good with alcohol. Cocaine, once it was done, never touched it again. Had no, no cravings for it, didn't care about it. I haven't touched it and I don't even know how many decades. Uh, I never say that I've quit forever because I know I haven't. It's a constant battle. Ask any reformed drunk, they'll tell you everything I'm saying ver verbatim. But at any rate, getting back to the book, that was how I decided to write it, is bare my soul. And that's what I did. And once I was kicked out of Quiet Riot, three days out, I cut off all my hair. I enrolled in paramedic school, which was something that I wanted to do all my life. I became an EMT, um, got hired immediately. I went on from working ambulance to become a professional photographer, owned studios, and um, was hot shit here in Vegas for all the models, did all the shows, stars. Um, very, very successful, made a real lot of money, owned four studios, had employees, everything. Amazing work, by the way. I, I looked at some of your work and it's just, I mean, you could see the true artistry in it. Uh, yeah, which that happened accidentally. I had a wife, well, I've had a bunch of them, but um, one of my wives said, you know, you should be an artist. And I said, me, an artist? And, and she said, yeah. She said, you, you create art and you're not even trying. And I said, I do that, huh? And she, and she said, yeah. And she said, look at this. And she pointed it out to me. And she said, you know, a lot of art is accidental anyway. And I went, hmm, I like that. And, and so I actually made an effort to be an artist. And I've actually had success with that. I sell work all the time. I'm in three different galleries up here in Nevada. And I've sold work worldwide, actually. And which, which comes as a big surprise to me. And that was one of, one of the offshoots of photography. And... Um, so I became an artist, um, I became a writer, and I was a musician. So now I had three things going for me. And the photography thing was always interesting because it, it had that Las Vegas flavor to it. Uh, the first half of the book is about the time I spent with Randy. And then the second half of the book is chap starts with chapter 15. And under chapter 15 it says, the next 32 years because that's what it's about, is how all my life I've been pretty much sort of a token member of Quiet Riot. Uh, I'm known as Randy's best friend, and, and these are things that I can't escape. When I worked ambulance, none of those people knew who I was or where I came from or anything. Uh, I did find that, that in, when I did photography that my background in Quiet Riot and the fact that I had done something like that actually helped. So I let people talk about it, but it really wasn't anything I advertised. Uh, I didn't see anything to advertise about it to me because Frankie's version of Quiet Riot and what I was in are two different things. The name is only the same and the singer um, until unfortunately recently. But. Um, so that was how I approached the book, and, and it, it just, um, the whole second half of it is how, I sometimes joke that I was kicked out of Quiet Riot 30-something years ago, and I'm still trying to get kicked out. 
But in writing the book, I was actually rather surprised, if not eventually somewhat traumatized, by having to basically relive my entire life over. It's not as easy as you think. And that's what I had to do. And the second half of the book, I ended up living with my mom. And she told me that at night I had horrible nightmares. I yelled in my sleep, screamed in my sleep, and, and I did. It, it made my life a living hell to get this book done. I couldn't wait to finish it. And um, uh, it, it was just, actually, it brought up a lot of memories that I maybe didn't want to remember. And I also interviewed a lot of people for this book to refresh my own memory and, and to get their versions or their um, viewpoints and, and their opinions and, and what their relationship was to Randy. And often in talking to these people, they would remind me, they would remind me of something that happened and I'd go, oh my God, I can't believe I fucking forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. And, and you know, now they're telling me my life story. And, and so, the whole deal of making this thing is not easy. It, it, it's just, it's a nightmare. I don't recommend anybody sit down and do it anytime soon. Believe me, my next book is going to be a fiction where I can lie my ass off. I can tell all kinds of stories and it's all just shit that I made up. That's what I'm looking for. And I do have another book plan. Um, so, um, this book was, was hard for those reasons. But, I do have the support of Randy's family, unlike any other book that's out there currently now. The book, from what I understand, is, is by the people that have given me a, a big thumbs up on it, is that I've captured that time and error in Randy and me's life together. We, we were together a total of nine years. No one else has played with Randy for nine years, or been his friend, or been involved with him for nine years outside of his family and neighbors that he grew up with, people like that. I'm the only non-relative guy that came from nowhere, weird ass kid in school that he brought home one day. I'm the only one. And so I was really the only one that could tell the story and, and as many times as I wanted to not write this book, I was always reminded that, hey, you're the only one that can tell it so you have to do it. And so. I just hungered down and just did it. And now that it's done, I'm glad. People ask me, well, you know, it must have really been um, soul cleansing for you to really bury yourself like that for the whole world. And I say, nah, no fucking way. It wasn't, it didn't cleanse my soul. And so, <laughs> you know, that's basically, um, I was the only one that could tell that story, and luckily I had enough people to help me tell it. And, and so from what I'm told, this nailed it. I got it. I did it. I'm a successful book writer, and I wrote a successful book about Randy because, according to people that know him, this book tells what he was really like. And that's what everybody seems to want to know, you know? it's. His guitar playing has been studied and studied and studied every way it can be. It's been wondered about, it's been written about, it's been taken apart surgically, musically, theory-wise, you name it, every single part. What effects he used, what transistor he had in his amp, what kind of speakers he had in his cabinets. His music has been analyzed every way possible. If there was a proctologist for music, believe me, it's gone through Randy Rhodes's um, uh, volume of playing that, that he did accomplish when he was on this earth. And the big question remained was, what was this guy like as a person? Right after he died, um, people came to me, magazines mostly, came to me and wanted to interview me. And, and I was a completely different person. And I was like, why would some rock magazine want to interview me? And they all said the same thing. They said, well, you know, we talked to the family, we talked to everybody else, and everybody says you were his best friend and nobody knew him better than you. So that's why we want to talk to you. And I'd say, oh, well, 
you know, if you if you want me to tell you, you know, what kind of strings he used on his guitar, you know, I mean, I kind of, I do happen to know that, but, um, you know, if you want to know, you know, why he did this arpeggio thing in this song or that, I don't fucking know, you know, so you're going to the wrong guy, and it's like, no, 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 we, we want to know about what he was like as a person, and and so I was like, oh, well. Well, I don't know, you, you know, I, I really didn't grasp the significance of, of the fact that I was even being asked what kind of a person he was. I thought it was a one-time thing. This one magazine had come along and asked me what kind of a person Randy was. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Somebody actually wants to know. I did the interview and I gave him some pictures I had. And I could not foresee what happened after that. The next thing I know, everybody wanted to know what Randy was like. And since the day he's died, I've gone down to his uh, resting place in San Bernardino on the anniversary of his death. People began to show up down there. I mean, we, there were years we'd get only like 50 people, and some years we'd get like maybe 500, but always it was the same. What was he like as a person? What, what kind of stuff did he like to do? What was his favorite foods? Um, you know, what, what did he do for fun? Did he read? What kind of books did he read? You know, uh, what kind of TV shows did he like? You know, all these things about this person. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I had no idea people wondered to that extent about him. And that has done nothing but fostered itself into a huge part of his legacy in that his music has been studied and copied and influenced so many people that, that now everybody wants to know, well, what was the guy like? And so a lot of the last 32 years, going on 33 now, apparently, um, I've spent answering questions about what he was like. And so that's why the, the whole idea of the book seemed necessary. I understood why they wanted the book. I just didn't know what I was going to do. So I tried to tell everybody what he was like and how we became the people that we became. And sadly, he died at such a young age, 25, that he really never get to develop into a, a full-grown human being, which I'm still trying to do at age 55. So no one ever really got to know what, what kind of a person he would have become. But his time that he spent here on the planet certainly made a huge impact on a lot of people and influenced a lot of people in very positive ways. It's amazing to me when I go down to the cemetery uh, on the anniversaries and there's little kids, 13, 14, 15, you know, with these bewildered parents behind them, some old 80s mom that doesn't look like she looked back then, and she's, this is her kid, and, and her kid came to her and, and said, you know, hey, I want to go to Randy Rhodes' anniversary. And, and the mom would sit there and throw her hands up and say, I don't get it. He listens to the same kind of music I was listening to. And, and, and he begged me to bring him here today. You know, we came all the way from K Kentucky or somewhere. Amazing. And this little kid's just looking up at me, you know, and like, like he wants me to tell him all about Randy and, and, that, and the last questions. And, and that's part of Randy's legacy. And, you know, by no fault of my own, and certainly to the dismay of many, I'm a huge part of it because I knew him best. So certainly putting it out in book form was the best way to go about it. And to continue being supportive of his legacy is the best thing I can do. Although I will say this, upon writing this book, I am going to take a few steps back out of the, the limelight that, that's uh, cast on me by his legacy. And I'm going to concentrate on Kelly Garney. I have things I have to deal with. I have my own issues. I'm only a year sober. I have to keep working on that. Uh, I love writing. I have to continue writing. I still play music and I, I still play in bands and I'm still doing that and I have to, these are all things that have to do with Kelly Garney, not Randy Rhodes. So right now it's all about Kelly Garney in my life. But as far as Randy's legacy, I'm loyal to, to it to my dying day. I'll never abandon it completely. I get emails every day from fans asking me questions. I do my very best to answer each and every one of them. 
and uh, every once in a while one will slip by and then they'll just write me back and I feel badly because I always want to be stayed or stay in, in uh, good touch with Randy's admirers and his fans. Uh, but, but really, the book is pretty much it for me. And, um, but if you want to know about Randy and how he became as good as he became and what he was like as a person, the things he liked to do, read my book. We spent a lot of really good years together and uh, we really formed something special. And it had somewhat of an impact on the world in a very small way. We became a part of rock and roll history, however small and molecule-sized it might be in the grand scheme of it all. We actually, all that practicing paid off for something. Hi, I'm Kelly Garney. This is my book, Angels with Dirty Faces, that I've written about my time with Randy Rhodes. And this is for Rock This Magazine. That's a wrap. Okay.